the collaboration you lose a lot of um helping address it has been my experience that as a white person i have a profound ability to create problems in areas that i didn't even know were areas i want to tell parents who might be listening that this is hard the learning is hard the conversations are hard and making mistakes and getting back into it is hard but it's necessary it is my opinion that communities and individual people are either part of the problem or part of the solution. It's that simple. There's no gray area here. Desmond Tutu famously said that if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. We are better than that. We are lucky, some might say privileged, to live in a town where our children are safe, where crime rates are low, and where we have a police department, and specifically a police chief, that invests in us as much as we invest in them. Last year, our school leadership team encouraged Elisa Gittens Carl, our Met Co director, and the High School Diversity Club to bring the film The Hate You Give into the schools and have a robust conversation about the subject of the film, which is the complex relationship between law enforcement and communities of color. Our police department jumped at the opportunity to participate in this discussion and did so through the participation of officers that our students know and respect. Our students know and respect them because the department prioritizes our students and cultivating relationships with them. I'm grateful for and want to specifically thank Officer Taylor and Sergeant Detective Lopes, as well as Chief Quigley for their commitment to our community, our schools, and our students. Just before the schools were closed because of COVID-19, the leadership team was days away from hosting a district-wide professional development day that would teach school administration, faculty, and staff about the complex issues of race, equity, and inclusion. I'm grateful that our leadership team continues to make the commitment to being better, to learning and growing as a district and a community around the issue of race. We have begun to do the work. We need to do much, much more. We need to critically analyze our approach and our curriculum. We need to acknowledge that the entire system of public education, creation of school curriculum, standardized testing, and measurements of student achievement and outcomes was created within the same systems and by the same people that oppress our fellow Americans. We need to stand up and be responsible in our actions, in our words, and even in our thoughts. And we do so, as we do so, we will be part of the change. In his letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King makes the statement that he almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative piece, which is the absence of tension to a positive piece, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically feels that he can see the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I'm asking our leadership team to continue to do the work to continue to create space for having difficult conversations. I'm asking our committee to create space for and commit to having difficult conversations about this too. I'm asking our committee in its entirety to commit to showing up for conversations about race, equity, and inclusion in our community and when possible in others. I'm asking parents to reach out for help when they don't know what to say because not saying anything is no longer an what we as a society and as a community have done thus far has gotten us here. And what we do moving forward will determine where we go. Please remember that our experience here is different than the lived experience in other communities. That doesn't make us better. It doesn't remove us from the problem. It certainly doesn't qualify us to be arbiters of others' behavior as they fight for their rights and their lives. It does leave us with a choice. We can choose whether we will be part of the problem or part of the solution. Thank you. Wow. Thank, thank you, Ashley. Very, very well said. Very heartfelt, um, I can tell. And uh, something I, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it, you, you can't not think in your quiet moments and your busy moments and your hectic moments about what is going on in our country today. And um, I applaud your efforts and um, we do need to help affect change, um, you know, assertively. 
and not not moderately. So thank you. Um, okay, Superintendent Sullivan. Yes, thank you. And I echo what um, Chair has said regarding uh, the heartfelt thoughts and the really authentic and, and human condition that this um, situation touches. It, uh, you know, my heart absolutely goes out to um, our students of color. Our, our heart, my heart goes out to any everyone who should be uh, affected by this. So thank you for those comments. And what I really appreciate, Ashley, is your comments around our need to continue the discourse. Um, it's absolutely paramount. You know, you mentioned that we have uh, professional development and we have a, a fabulous MECO leader in Elisa Gittins Carl. You've seen her here present. Um, she's a, a great help to us. And um, it is absolutely uh, a belief in the leadership team to, to uh, continue to explore and make one of our major tenets of our next strategic plan, the idea of cultural competency and understanding race and talking more about race and having open conversations. Uh, the conversations that I witnessed around the hate you give were amazingly powerful, open, I thought very uh, educational for staff and for me, and I believe for students as we shared um, our thoughts and, and ideas. And, and that's just a start. Uh, you know, we need to go deeper and I look forward to setting up and working with you, Ashley, and the rest of the committee, more conversations that can dig into the community uh, regarding race and regarding this issue. Uh, I'll say I'm extremely proud of those students who were um, very uh, civilly and appropriately demonstrating um, on the common with signs that were showing solidarity to our our students of color and to our um, you know to the to, to the situation at hand. Uh, that type of peaceful demonstration is how we've made change in our country, and it's this it's the voice of the youth that really makes those changes. Um, you know, when Malcolm X made changes, he was, a, he was a young man. When Martin Luther King made changes, he was a young man. It comes from that energy that is uh, in the youth. And I really think this particular generation has a great opportunity in front of them. And I see signs that they're, they're gonna follow through with that and really make the change so that we have a, a better world for their kids. Uh, and I'm, I just, I'm just really encouraged by your words today, Ashley. So thank you. Um, and Margaret, I don't know. I'm going to hand it off to you. But um, on a uh, on a senior note, you know, Margaret Margaret has absolutely um, been someone who has uh, fought for uh, causes throughout the time I've known her, and she's a great example of someone who stands for what she believes in and. Uh, and uh, makes makes the point and is ready to have discourse regarding that. So Margaret absolutely um, is uh, a, a person who who I'm talking about in my comments. But Margaret um, obviously is a senior, so hopefully um, she's going through some times where she can personally reflect on her accomplishments. And uh, I'm very proud that I got to know Margaret uh, this past year more than the year before, but a little the year before and. Uh, I'm really impressed with her and her classmates. So we had a couple of events that happened. Um, well, one main one, one's coming this weekend, but we had a senior drive-in, which was a way to, uh, to acknowledge our seniors in a socially distancing way. I have to say, it, from my opinion, I was there watching uh, cars come in. I was expecting it to be more uh, of an event that was just seniors kind of driving alone in their cars. I'm thinking back from, my, uh, my experience when I was a senior, I probably didn't want my whole family in the car. And I was so impressed that it was a family event. There were families in these cars arriving to see the senior film. Um, it was really heartwarming. And I, I was so impressed with the character of the senior class. I have been the whole, the whole year, and I know Principal Scott would echo that, uh, as they watched and cheered on and honked on, I guess their classmates who were uh, on the big screen and thank you to the Cohasset Music Circus for enabling that for us and for all the work that those teachers did. So Margaret, I'll, I'll leave it to you to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about um, in, in your role as a senior advisor here and your last time to kind of give the, the committee your, uh, your thoughts. But, you know, obviously that was hopefully a good moment for your senior class. 
Um, so I'm, I'm glad about that. So I'll turn it over to you, Margaret, and then I'll let the committee ask any questions you might have, Margaret. Yeah, of course. So um, first of all, I'm just going to talk about senior events a little bit, get everyone kind of on the same page there. Um, the, movie, the movie night was amazing, and I'm so grateful for Jason and Tucker and other people in my grade who participated in setting that up, and also the teachers, the music circus, for allowing that to happen. Um, this week coming up, we have the senior awards night, the class night on Friday. That'll be on 143 TV at 7 p.m. And then on Saturday, we'll have our diploma pickup event. We'll wear our cap and gowns, get our diploma in the photo, and then head out of there, I guess, until hopefully uh, we can have a real ceremony at the end of the summer. Um, some words just that I have in relation to what Ashley just discussed um, is that I think because I have this platform to speak on, I really have a responsibility to, to say something as well. I think I've been really impressed with the way that my class and other people from Cohasset have acted over the last few weeks, not weeks, days, on social media by posting and showing their support and even demonstrating downtown. I think that I've played a role on the diversity subcommittee of the Coasset Safe Schools Committee. I've been a part of different clubs and activism, activism groups and as well as the um, super, Superintendent Student Advisory Council. And I think that there's been so much progress made while I've been here, but we still have a lot of strides that we have to make to, to be where we need to be as a town. Um, I have some notes written down with some ideas, but I think I have to ponder over them a little bit more before I'm willing to share them on such a public platform. Um, but I look forward to being able to reach out to our administrators to be able to communicate some of those ideas in the future. I look forward to that, Margaret. Thank you. Very well said. Any questions from Margaret? I just want to say I hope that you share your ideas. I really love to know. <laughs> I do too. I'm sure you will. I don't I'm mean to share the that. Ideas. To be, like, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, Margaret. Very crushing you, but I, I'm sure. I, just you will. <laughs> participation in this forum thus far, I'm sure that they're going to be really very wonderful. Thank you. Margaret. Margaret's ideas have consistently been very um, important and helpful. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask you, Margaret, if, if there were one or two things that words of wisdom that you could impart to the underclassmen for next year, knowing that we don't know what next year is going to look like, and you've lived through a, a remote learning uh, period of time, what would those words be? I think the key to are you saying in terms of if we have remote learning next year like navigating that or just you know just, making just dealing that? with not knowing what next year is going to look like okay um that's a lot of pressure um <laughs> oh, <yeah. I'm> sorry. <laughs> no worries no worries um i think that for the underclassmen something that's helped me survive this year with remote learning has been just knowing that you have an amazing staff and administrators that are there for you and that um, no matter where you are in the student body what kind of groups you're a part of what clubs you participate in if you do sports that um, senior year especially is about coming together as a class and learning to appreciate each other putting aside differences and just having that class unity and I really wish that earlier on in high school I had felt that closeness with my class and been able to embrace it. So I think that um, despite your differences with people in your class and no matter who you are, it's a really wonderful thing that you're able to be a part of this special community and just embrace it as much as you can while you have it. Awesome. That was great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Margaret. So uh, just a, a few other updates. Um, Obviously, we're still awaiting official guidance from the commissioner. I was on a call with the commissioner yesterday, um, and he was he was quite uh, open about the fact that you know remote learning will play a role in what we're doing going forward. So whatever that may be, um, whether it's a hybrid or um, uh, or whatever remote learning may play, or we have to turn and do remote learning, we're going to be preparing more uh, rigorously for that. Um, and to make it a, a more seamless event. As uh, you know, I've said several times, this was not um, the best conditions to launch a remote learning platform. 
Um, it really is pandemic learning. And we hope that we will be able to take what we've learned from that uh, and to make a, a more um, comprehensive situation for everyone as we move forward with, with remote learning. Uh, there is advice coming this week regarding summer uh, school and the ability for us to potentially have some in-person summer school opportunities. Uh, we, we'll have to determine that as a district, what we want to do with our ESY program, for example, and also with camps and, and, uh, and so forth moving forward. Uh, we are in a position now where we're populating, beginning to populate those teams that I had set out and, and uh, put, put out to the uh, community, uh, and we'll be ready for the guidance when it comes. My goal will be to have that, those teams set by uh, the end of next week. We will be using some of our existing teams, our Safe Schools team, which is uh, made up of a lot of uh, different stakeholders, including parents. Um, some of those uh, parents are in actual committees, building safety, for instance, and um, social emotional learning committees uh, that tie right into what we're going to have to help students with. Um, and we'll also be taking some, some other people who might be interested from the community and coming in as well uh, from the school community to help out with that. We'll use the wellness team, which is a, I know that um, Paul is on that, and that's a great team that will help us with some of our social uh, distancing protocols. Um, and we'll be ready to roll with that. And the, the idea will be to have a um, roadmap set for folks late July, early August, and we can do some public forums and really get more voice on what we're going to be putting forward so that when we're, when we are in the fall and we're ready to go, uh, we'll have all the pieces in place and everyone will understand where we're coming from and we'll have every angle that we can possibly handle uh, covered. So that's something that's um, that's really important to us, and I feel like we're we're moving in that direction, and that's a good thing. So people should should feel good about that. Um, there's something else I was going to say, and I'm looking at uh, you can't tell I'm looking at. I'm looking at Dr. Scullins here to remember. There's something else I wanted to mention. Oh, we've been talking about the. I know what it is. We've been talking about our needs as a uh, school community in terms of preparation, and a couple of areas we know we're going to have to work on over the summer. One is remote learning. And uh, if there are fundings coming our way, certainly remote learning will be a place that we apply it to. The other is social emotional learning. And really in this particular case, it's social emotional wellness and it's dealing with trauma. It's dealing with the trauma of, of the events uh, that have happened in the pandemic, people coming in and also, you know, the, this recent event. We're gonna have, we have students that haven't been in the physical school building for a third of the year. That in itself, is something that we as teachers and parents and um, administrators have to work together with our students to help them feel better as they come in. And we have to set up structures so that we're ready for them in that way. So those two areas will be really uh, front and center in the work we do uh, moving forward. So those are just a couple of little updates I wanted to provide for the committee. Obviously, when I receive official information, which is mid-June, which seems like an eternity, because I'd like it like three weeks earlier, so I could do some more planning, but uh, I will share with, with the committee and we'll, we'll be transparent and get working on it right away. But um, I do feel encouraged by the committee, the commissioner's words in our uh, call that he is committed to, to, tr to move, to come back in the fall uh, with some social distancing and uh, protocols in place. That in itself is a good first step. So, so that's where I'm um, from there. Dr. Sullivan, before you move on, um, I shared um, this afternoon with the committee, and I apologize if everybody didn't get a chance to read it, but your um, documents on, with your subcommittee, your steering committee, and your subcommittees. So yes. anyone on the school committee is interested in serving on one of those, should they contact you directly? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there'll be a place for anybody uh, on the committee who wants to join one of those subcommittees. Some of you are already on it by virtue of you know, being on the wellness committee and Craig, you're on the safe schools committee on the building safety committee. So if you wanted to join that uh, facilities uh, group, you could. And, but if you wanted to join a different group, you could as well. Like your voices are really crucial and important. So yeah, do I do want to join that one, Dr. Sullivan. So uh, that was the one I had interest in. So I, am I automatically on that by virtue of being in the safe schools? You are. I'm going to invite you formally, but I'm going to invite that safe schools committee to be on that because it makes sense. That's what you're set to do. Um, and the good thing about that team is we already have working relationships with 
the uh, the safe schools team. It involves all of the administrators. So all that the stuff you have to do to get teams rolling, we, we, we know each other and we work well together and it's, it involves a lot of parents. And I'm not saying that we're, we wouldn't bring some others in to help and advise, but um, I think those are really good core groups for us to, to work with. So yes, Craig, you'll be on it and I'll invite you uh, formally with them probably tomorrow in the next couple of days. Great, I love formal invitations. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Great. So with, um, Without further ado, oh, I'm going to share my screen clumsily, like I always do. Um, let's see. All right, this is the PDF. I think you could probably go with this, though. Sorry, guys. All right. Okay. My apologies, Alex and um, Leslie. I'm having trouble getting the, the Google Doc up right now on my screen, but I think you can work with this and I'll just advance it. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, Dr. Scollins and Principal Sullivan uh, to talk about. Uh, the plan we have in place for uh, our Deer Hill instructional model next year, um, not as a reason behind this, but I should just add that uh, you know, we'll be talking about a self-sustained model here. And that self-sustained model um, was also alluded to by the commissioner uh, that that will be something that he's hoping to institute at, uh, hoping that or well, he'll be asking us to institute in uh, at elementary schools. What he's really saying is to minimize the movement. So I think this will tie into that as well, but obviously there are reasons behind it, which we'll talk about today. I should say that he did reassert before we get into this, that what the information we get, the guidance we get will be 85 to 90, he moved up to 90, Jennifer, percent prescriptive. He said there's a time when the, he felt that the Department of Education had to take the reins and really had to tell folks what to do and he thought that this was the time to do it in terms of keeping it uniform across all districts. So he, he, he said there'll be chances to apply for changes in the plan, but he, his basic message was stick with the group and we're gonna give you the safety measures that you need. And I'm actually thankful for that because I think it, uh, it, it stops the comparisons between you know, one community and another community and it, it, it is guided by health officials and not just educational officials. So I think that's really important in this particular context. So turn it over to Alex and to um, Leslie regarding the instructional model. And I'll, I'll forward the slides, Alex. Great, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And um, so just a little background, um, and I'm actually gonna let Alex speak to most of this, but um, one of the things that we've done this year is that we've um, really had some good discuss discussions around curriculum and um, what's happening in our buildings. And in particular, something that came up was, what is the instructional model at schools? Um, what does it look like? And so, um, you know, we looked at all of the schools and one of the things that came up in particular at Deer Hill was that there were multiple instructional models at grade levels and between grade levels. And so the question was, why is that? And, and, and what, you know, and, and how does that impact kids? And, and, and what do we think about it? So um, we engaged in some conversations as a leadership team, but also um, Dr. Sullivan and Principal Sullivan and I, you know, had some good conversations about all right, well, let's find out why and let's figure out what we think is best for kids and how are we going to figure that out. And so um, we came up with a plan to, to look at the model and ask some questions and then create what we thought would be the best model moving forward. So I will, that's kind of the preface and I will turn it over to Alex. I don't, do you want to go back? Yes, please, Pat, if you could go back. Thank you. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so as Leslie said, um, hello everyone, by the way, uh, as Leslie said, you know, historically at Deer Hill, there have been multiple instructional models in place. 
Um, what you see here is what is currently in place for this school year. And as you can see, um, among grade levels, it is not consistent. There's a progression to it, um, but it is, there's a variety of things in place. Some of it is based on enrollment. For example, uh, if you look at grades four and grade five, there currently is a self-contained classroom. Uh, prior to this year, or most recently, they were, had, um, they switched more, all classes switched. Uh, however, because once you have an odd number of classrooms, you have to make adjustments. Um, teachers volunteered or, or worked, you know, made, made the decision to become the self-contained classes. And, um, as you can see from grade three, they currently only, and again, when I say currently, I'm speaking like in our building, building environment, they switched for just social studies and science. Um, in grade four, in the past, they had, or most recently, again, they've done a variety of things. They've also had years where they just switched for social studies and science. Um, they also, most recently, prior to this year, switched for, um, one teacher was math, and science and the other teacher was social studies and reading and then they taught their own writing but because of moving to a self-contained class having one self-contained class this year they decided to each take on their own social studies and science so this year they only switch for math and reading fifth grade um, still employs the model that fourth grade has used in the past where you have one teacher that teaches math and science you have one teacher that teaches reading and social studies and then the teacher of record teaches writing um, to their own class. Grade five also has a self-contained class this year. This year with the implementation of our WIN model, which is our um, MTSS, response to intervention, one of, our, one of those um, interventions, all teachers across um, all grade levels do teach math um, 45, for 45 minutes twice a week. So they are, um, doing that as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different things happening at different grade levels. Uh, there have been times I, I, I did some research and kind of went back through the years. There was one year where grade five, one teacher just taught science. Um, classes were split up for social studies, like one class was split in half and went to different rooms. There's just been lots of different things happening. Um, and, uh, and so it definitely kind of fueled the idea that it was time to maybe look at this with a real purposeful lens and make sure from a pedagogical standpoint that we were, we were doing things for, and from a student-centered student uh, perspective. All right, Pat, take it away. So as Leslie alluded to, um, we you know, started this conversation at the leadership level and you know, decided that it was something that we wanted to look at more carefully. Um, we'll give, as we go along here, that we'll dive more deeply into the reasons behind that. But, um, um, and so we, we mapped out a plan and a process, and that's outlined here in terms of when we kind of started, how we started moving forward. So the first step was, you know, communicating our intention to do this, that we wanted to look at things, and that our goal was to build consistency for a variety of reasons. Um, that was shared with the staff initially in early in mid February. Um, I spoke about it with um, my school council, and I communicated to the union that that was something that we were going to be looking at, and and the reason why. From there, Leslie and I, Dr. Scollins and I, um, we conducted multiple what we call the listening tour. We took our show on the road uh, throughout the halls of Deer Hill when we still had that luxury, and we met with different groups of stakeholders in, in small groups. We met with each grade level individually uh, to include the special ed teacher that works with them most closely. We also met with the SPED teachers as a separate group because I think that's a, a unique perspective that needed to be looked at independently. We met um, in that group was the reading specialist and the math specialist, also support teachers such as speech and um, OT. And then we met with the specialist teachers. And, and you might ask, well, wait a minute, we're, we're talking about you know, making a change within a classroom. What's, why are we uh, you know, meeting with all these different groups? But the reality is that we are a cohesive 
building and these kinds of decisions Im impact everyone. If you're a SPED teacher, it impacts your delivery of service and with whom you're working. If you're a specialist teacher, it um, impacts just your groupings and things like that, students moving through the building. So um, reading the reading and math specialists have a really unique perspective in that they do a lot of intervention work and really have um, a bird's eye view of many classrooms and, and how, how things are, are moving. So we thought it was really important that all stakeholders really had an even and equitable voice in um, in what we were trying to you know what we were considering we were very clear in those listening tours that we that we were listening we that was a very purposeful name and we took that seriously uh, leslie and i both have copious notes from those meetings and we really, we were, we were straightforward with our own personal experiences. You know, I have 20 years in the classroom. Leslie has extensive classroom experience, extensive, you know, elementary school leadership experience. And, and so we were honest with our own experiences and, and, and how that lens contributes to kind of the vision that we share for the Deer Hill School. And so that was a part of the conversation. Um, we really saw these listening tours as a way to identify the concerns teachers might have um, toward any changes we might make and then how we could address those concerns effectively. Basically what we were looking to see was is what we're starting to kind of picture going to gel with what teachers prioritize and, and how they function in our building and how they provide effective instruction. So that was a, a big piece of this. It was not looking, our listening tour was not looking for a, a majority voice or some kind of you know, voting process or anything like that. It was really taking that input to help us make an informed decision uh, about the direction we wanted to go. With that in mind, we, oh, Pat, sorry. <laughs> we did review our notes carefully and, you know, again, working collaboratively at the leadership level, we did make the determination that we wanted to build a consistent model across the building and that we felt that a, a self-contained autonomous model where teachers, um, each grade level teacher was responsible for content delivery was the way to go. Uh, once that decision was made, it was communicated to staff at a staff meeting. Uh, it was communicated, uh, I believe, to the school committee by Dr. Scollins. I met with school council and reviewed the, the why with them. And it was shared with families in a newsletter um, as well. So to dig a little deeper into our why, there's a lot of things that went into this decision. And I do really wanna stress that one thing that you will not find in this why is the idea that something at Deer Hill is broken. Um, it's really, it's really not about that, but it's about, you know, kind of that work smarter, not harder mentality. And also um, that idea, another little catchphrase I, I always like to use is, you know, do better, be better. And we're always looking to improve and, and, and reevaluate. We want to move forward. We want to grow and we want to do the things that are, are going to move our needle for a variety of ways. And so some of those whys are about moving that needle. One is, is looking for that consistency and alignment. And I really pride myself on being um, an instructional leader that is not looking for lockstep. I, I, I really believe in teacher autonomy. I believe in teachers' professionalism and their ability to develop their own way. Um, but I do think there is a place for consistency. And I think this is an example of that. And so that was one of the areas, especially when we look at what Osgood's doing, we look at the needs of the middle school. Well, they, you know, as we know, switch classes. There are things that we can do to prepare those students for that experience here without needing to actually do that at this point. Another piece that we looked at is the integration of curriculum across all content areas. That, is a, that was a huge piece of this process. I, I think Leslie, Dr. Scollins and I, our background really is embedded in that idea that you are constantly looking at how uh, a piece of literature that you read, um, how it, how it pr you know, promotes your writing experience and how it can tie to your science and how it can connect to all the things that you're doing. And one of the, the real joys of the elementary classroom experience is being able to integrate curriculum to that degree, to, to use a, a text to launch a social studies conversation in a way that you don't have that flexibility at, a, at the middle and high school level to the same degree. And I just think it's worth preserving for as long as possible. Um, definitely when you think about 
kind of what I go into in the next point, uh, flexibility and scheduling to allow for deep dives and project-based learning. Um, thinking back to when we had our listening tour, I remember being in, in, in one of the grade levels and a teacher saying it would be really nice, you know, if I'm in that moment and we're really connected to what we're doing to, to say, you know what, I can shuffle things around a little bit and we can keep going. Let's keep writing. Let's keep that momentum and not have that feeling of like, oh, time to switch. And again, it's a luxury that elementary schools have to be able to, to have that flexibility. And I think that's very important at this, at this developmental level. Uh, ability to provide meaningful collaboration, grade level teaming, I have to move, sorry, I have to move everyone's faces out of the way, uh, and student groupings that are grounded in differentiation and recognition of student needs, for example, our WIN program. So it's very interesting. I think as I've, I've heard, um, you know, feedback and things like that. One of the things we heard for on our listening tour is that is that teachers are very collaborative at Deer Hill School. And that's something that with the departmentalized model, they were very proud of the idea that they worked that the math and science teacher worked collaboratively with her um, reading and social studies partner in mm -hmm. in getting to know students and things like that. Um, we feel strongly that that collaboration will only increase with this model, but that it'll take on a whole, many more layers in terms of that collaboration. Because when you're, when you're working towards the same curricular goals, all of a sudden the fire, you know, the fireworks really kick in when you have that many more people to work with. I think that teachers really enjoy kind of having that partner person. And I can speak from experience, you know, I've been on grade levels where there were nine teachers in the grade level. I've been on grade levels where it was as small as three. And, um, you know, I always, I know that feeling of working collaborative, live co collaboratively with a larger group, but then also having that, that person, you know, you need your person and your partner. And I think that this model allows for that different kinds of groupings among the teachers and planning and playing to strengths. Um, I've been so impressed with Deer Hill teachers as part of remote learning and how they've demonstrated this and how they've pivoted and our weekly communication plans. Everyone's working on different curricular areas. They're integrating them and they're coming together. And that's what we want to see in our day-to-day -day practice. I think it shifts the focus on student groupings from moving students around the building um, as driven by a content area to moving students purposefully based on their need. Um, what I mean by that, with this type of a model, you might be, you know, next door or a couple doors down from a teacher at your grade level and it's, it's your ELA time. And between your two groups of students, you've identified this group of students, you know, maybe eight students or six students that need a little extra help with their phonological skills. And then maybe you've got this other group that is really targeting, you know, their higher level comprehension skills and you've got different things happening and you can still move those groups and, and partner with that teacher and collaborate to say, okay, I'm going to grab that group and I'm going to work on this. And you take a couple kids from my my group, because that fills out what you, you know, a group. And so there's a lot of opportunities to differentiate with this model because you have, again, that, that many more opportunities to work um, with that, that student-focused lens. Uh, another factor in this is, you know, we do have a new math adoption this next year. One thing that's really important to me is to remember that you know, we are, and I always, I always go def default back to the language. Um, Principal, know. Principal Sullivan, can I just interrupt yeah. you for one second? Not to destroy yeah. your cadence here, but I just, um, sorry, it took me a couple minutes to find my little face here. <laughs> sorry, I can't see you. So yes. So um, I know I'm very private like that during these things, but oh. uh, just to go back to the last bullet point and where you yeah. were last point, you're talking about student groupings. Yes. Um, I, I'm trying to better understand what you're saying. I, I so the. I think what you're saying is, um, so when I was in school, right, um, uh -huh. fifth grade, it started to, is, is when they started to sort of, I don't want to use the term segregate, but separate groups of students based on like academic ability. Like, so there'd mm. be like a higher level reading, a middle level reading. So okay. is, is this model sort of designed to eliminate that so that like all students are still together? Like, in other words, I didn't like that because I think it sort of, uh, it, it sort of, put like a scarlet letter on those students. No, 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 no. That's not, thank you. I'm so glad you asked that question. That's really an important one. So we're not talking about a tracking model at all. We're talking about very, very fluid, flexible opportunities. It can be as simple as sticking your head through the door and saying, hey, I'm doing this writing lesson too. How, how's your group doing with this part of it? And a teacher saying, 
well, I have a group that's working on and embedding, you know, figurative language into their writing. Oh, I've got a couple kids that are doing that too. Let me grab them and let's work on that together. This is not a tracking model at all. That's awesome. Um, that yeah. Great. So it's, it's yeah, really, have, yeah. I'm sorry. We do not have a level. There's no level. We don't level. Yeah. Um, now, our, our WIN model does support students, again, in a very function-targeted MTSS way. That's, that's, a, that's a different animal, but it is knowing, it is about moving students around, again, based on what, what they, the, it could also be interest-based. There's, you know, different opportunities to do that. You might have a partner teacher, you know, that you're collaborating with, and you're doing book groups, and okay, this teacher, you know, instead of you, you might say, okay, these are the book titles that this teacher's offering in her small book groups, and these are the titles that this teacher's offering, and then teachers can move, you know, students can move across and, you know, select and just have more options in that kind of way. Where currently, uh, if I'm a fifth grade student, I, you know, I have my, my reading teacher, and then I have my, my science and math teacher. So I'm not gonna have that, that versatility. My science and math teacher isn't going to be offering me any literature selections. Um, so it just opens up a different kind of collaboration between teachers because I do anticipate they'll still kind of find their person. That person, you know, while they'll work collaboratively as a team, they'll still probably have that teacher or teachers that might be, you know, that they work with on a tighter place. And that, that was my experience in the classroom over you know, those 20 years is that I had that teacher that we, we, sh we just kind of worked a little more tightly than the larger group. Does that help answer your question? Sure did. I, I love it. Thanks so much for, for, uh, sure. for, doing that, for going through ha that. Happy. You. I'm glad. Please just, just yell out because I can only see a few of you in my little window. So I, I won't know if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're just, you know, just go for it. Um, and so again, uh, we do have a new math adoption this year. And what I, was, uh, what I was saying was that I, I always default to the language of my time in California. In California, my license is called a multiple subject credential. That's what it's called. And, and in, in Massachusetts, it's the exact same license. It just has a different name. And I think it's really important to recognize that our, our teachers are trained and their skill set goes across all content areas. And it's really important that we keep those skills sharp, again, for that integrative piece and um, just the nature of the work we do at the elementary school. I know that originally when they did start departmentalizing it at Deer Hill, the plan was that they were going to switch their content areas after a couple of years. And I think um, just the nature of kind of the timing and with um, Dr. DeCare's retirement when it came about, it, it kind of slipped below the radar. And so um, I think I, I really feel strongly from a professional place that we have a responsibility to, you know, through our licensure, if we are calling ourselves highly effective teachers, then we should be able to teach across all content areas in that licensure with, um, with confidence. And so with that in mind, um, it's important that as we're looking at a new math program, that all teachers are, are confident in it, are able to implement it, and, um, and have the skills they need and the tools they need and the resources they need to do so. Yeah, I think it makes a lot more sense that if you, if, you know, even so that everyone has professional development um, in a, in a self-contained, everyone will be practicing it at the same time. If you don't, um, if, you, if you have it broken up and, and you're still only teaching science, you don't really get to learn the effectiveness of the math and you really don't, um, don't get to um, use it as much and therefore it's not as, uh, not as comfortable as Alex was saying, so. Right, and, if, and, and, and changes in assignment do happen. You know, for example, the teachers that went self-contained this year or teachers, you know, that, that for whatever reason changed their, their area and, and we do, you know, again, that, that's just, that's the nature of, of the job. We're, again, we're elementary teachers. Um, to continue with our why, teacher accountability for student performance and progress. I think this is a, you know, this speaks to some, some of our processes like child study, um, team meetings, some of the outside evaluations that we do. In, in my time here, while I do definitely um, recognize and admire the strong departmentalized partnerships that teachers have, I, I, I'm going to be very honest and say that sometimes I feel that the the teacher, the sense of the whole child as an academic student is not always as crystal clear as I would like it to be. And I just feel that it's very important that if you're the teacher of record, that you are able to speak to your, your student's reading ability, to their math ability, to every facet of that child. And, um, you know, if I'm sitting in a child study meeting with you and I ask you to speak to a child's reading ability, 
I don't want to hear, I'm sorry, I teach math and science. I don't think that's appropriate at the elementary school. And I think that that accountability piece is a little bit more of a, um, maybe a more constructive criticism of the, of the model that I've, the, some of the models that I've seen here at Deer Hill, but it's an important one. And I think it was definitely a part of our why. The social emotional well being of students is absolutely, you know, as, as I hope you've gotten to know me, is at the cornerstone of everything I believe about what we do. And I, again, I feel that our teachers do a phenomenal job of attending to this. They have engaged in responsive classroom. They, they foster deep relationships. And that's a real strength of the departmentalized model in that they, they do speak to each other about students and they do build relationships with, with students across classes. That being said, we feel, you know, based on, on the, you know, the work we did, that this will even be promoted to a greater degree with a self-contained model as teachers build a real sense of community with their one group of students. Um, I think from a developmental place, you know, having that home is, is really important. And I think that that is best served through this model. Um, so that's, um, that's a piece of this. From a, a logistical standpoint, it's also, and I, I don't know, I'm looking, I'm like looking at the slides here. Um, oh, no, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. I'll, I'll circle back to that one. Um, consistency and expectations and routines to benefit all students, um, but in particular, those with executive functioning challenges and dysregulation. And this, I, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, that I feel that um, there's there's a developmental continuum here, and I, I while I recognize that there's a progression in our current models at Deer Hill, that you know third grade switches less than fifth grade does. Um, I do think that there is work that we can do within a self-contained model to promote executive functioning that will better support students when they do get to the middle school and are switching classrooms classrooms and things. So in other words, I don't feel that they have to actually live it at the elementary school for us to be able to prepare them for it. And, and I can speak right now to the, the self-contained fifth grade class that will be traveling to the middle school next year. I have no doubt that those students are just as prepared as their peers for the middle school experience because that teacher in particular has really dialed into those executive functioning, those skills. And, and so that will transfer. It, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, there's certain things that you're just ready to do. And I think that through the other pieces that we're trying to accomplish this, with this, our students will be prepared for the middle school and um, the logistics of changing classes. Responsive classroom implementation, again, is really built on that idea of community and relationships and forming that those really tight knit circles. And, um, and that's also a time piece. Um, and so I'm kind of gonna toggle here between time on learning and, and responsive classroom implementation. An example of that is morning meeting. And I have to, again, admire the classroom teachers who wanting to have a bond with the, the class they switch with will hold a, a morning meeting with their class and then we'll hold a morning meeting with the, the other class. And, and that's, that's an important connection and that relationship building is, is important and, and paramount, but then you're, you're something has to give. And so that's you know 30 minutes that could be applied to the math lesson or something else when you're doing that twice. And so um, I think that responsive classroom implementation will be, it'll be implemented with more fidelity in this model. And again, to kind of toggle down, you know, the, the time on learning, the, the actual physical switching. We have some classes that switch from one corner of our building all the way to the others. And our teachers do such a nice job of having students line up carefully and, and stopping them and making sure those lines go smoothly through the hallway and, and doing all those important things. But that takes time. And um, again, I think that the logistical reasons for this switch are, are secondary to the philosophical and, and pedagogical ones. But I do think they're worth noting that it the, the model as it currently stands with the switching does impact time on learning. And, and that's a concern is we want to build rigor in our curriculum, which bumps me back up to that last last dot. And I think this is, you know, the other piece that um, I think kind of aligns with that, that teacher accountability one. It's, it's a little bit more of the um, constructive criticism of, of recognizing where we need to go. And I think that we are a strong school with strong test scores, 
but I don't know that we've reached our potential. And I think there is absolutely room for growth. And I feel that through this model that we will, again, through time on learning, through building those stronger relationships, through knowing students intimately across all their content areas and having the flexibility to recognize and, and manage your time in a way that will dial into the needs and the standards that students are expected to address, um, I think will help with, with our scores and just our overall student performance and demonstration of their knowledge and the relevance of their knowledge and why they're doing what they're doing. And so it doesn't feel like science class is just science class, but is really connected to the larger picture of their learning. Yeah, and Alex, if I could add, um, you know, the obviously the student outcome there is um, showing a higher degree of mastery of the standards. Right. That's really, that, that's really what that points to. Um, right. Just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you. So as part of this process, um, I was curious about, or we were curious about what's, what's happening elsewhere. Uh, so I am a member of you know, a South Shore Principals Group. I did send out a survey. Um, it's a very busy time, but um, I was pleased out of 81 principals queried, I did receive 32 responses. And these are, um, I asked a few other questions as well, but um, just to kind of highlight for the purposes of this presentation, 90.6% have a self-contained model to some degree in their buildings. 46.8% do have um, a departmentalized model to some degree. And then 59.4% have a consistent model across all grade levels. So it is definitely, um, we are not out of the bounds of what is typical to have a self-contained model across all of our, our grade levels. And um, it definitely speaks to it. And, and, and the comments were interesting in that survey too as well. And I think that, um, that there, there was, you know, I, I think some of this is, is a philosophical and a pedagogical, and I think you could argue both sides, but I do feel for our particular vision, as we look to some, you know, down the road um, curricular ideas and things like that, that this is the right decision for us. Um, so again, it's not that, that one is necessarily bad and one is good, it's that this is the, the right direction for us. Um, and then included in, in the, this presentation that I believe you received separately is some, some literature for, for you on this. So that's what I have for you. And I'm happy to take your questions and comments. Anyone on the committee have questions? Jen? You'd think by now I would get the unmute quickly, huh? <laughs> Um, I do have a couple of questions. Thank you. That was a really, um, uh, you know, one of the things I was wrote a note on as I was listening to you is what, what's the research? What does the research say? Um, but before, and, and, it, and it seems like you, um, have looked at the research. So, yes. Um, so, um, and I don't know whether this is, I mean, we are going to be entering a new school year with, with new rules. Is this, a, is, is uh, the commissioner recommending this or is this a requirement now? I mean, no. not that that had any bearing on your decision, but I'm just curious. So I'll, I'll answer a little bit of that if I could. Um, so no, it didn't have a bearing on our decision. We wanted to make sure that we were doing what was right for the students regardless. Um, however, you know, I can update on what the commissioner said in a question that was asked directly on uh, Tuesday, yesterday. Someone asked, will this mean, you know, if we're doing some sort of a social distancing situation, will it mean self-contained models at the elementary school? And he said, yes. He said yes, and he said no. I know he went off that quickly and said at the middle and high school, it'll mean um, I realize people are going to have to move a little bit, but we're going to try to limit the movement. And he suggested he used the word pods, like we have at our middle school, by the way. Those are like teams or pods, and he, he was suggesting that type of language. Now, that's what he said, but I have not seen the official document. So I'd fall short of saying it was an absolute but that was the answer that he gave, and that's why I mentioned it. Okay, and, and my other question was, I, I'm curious about the process 
that, you know, you went on the listening tour. Was, was there dissension? Was there a different view? What was the opposing view and how does the model accommodate whatever that opposing view was? Um, so, yes, I think that there are, there's a range of opinions in the building. And I think that, um, I think that our teachers recognize again, that they are licensed elementary teachers and as part of their job description and their role, that they are qualified to teach all areas. Um, again, we have two self-contained teachers right now. They are, have had very successful years and are very happy in those positions and um, all things staying the same would be, would be continuing in those roles. Um, you know, there's, I would say there's a variety of sentiments about it. When you asked about um, how we addressed concerns that arose, I think that when, when Dr. Scollins and I distilled our notes, the, the two themes, and I shared this very explicitly with the staff when we kind of talked about making this move, the two themes that really rose to the top were that collab the ability to collaborate and um, student well-being. And that's what teachers cared about. And that's what we want them to care about. And I, and, and so when we kind of looked at our notes and said, okay, you know, for some teachers, this is a little scary because change is hard, but this is why, this is what they're holding on to, And this is what they care about. And, and yes, we can absolutely, you know, that is at the forefront of what we want to do as well. It might look a little different for some of them, again, not all, um, but, um, but it is absolutely, we felt that we were able to address those concerns in in a constructive way so you know you know teachers are doing different things now and I think for for some you know continuing with the status quo um, feels very comfortable but I feel that my role as an instructional leader is again to move that needle and recognize look at that long-term vision and look at where I want to see us not as an individual classroom or um, grade level, but as a school and as a district down the road. And I have one more question. I'll keep it short after and let someone else have a turn. Um, I don't even know whether this is the appropriate venue for this, but you're making a decision about the math curriculum. And um, one of my concerns or thoughts is um, in making the decision and in knowing that our school is going to look different um, next year, um, that home component becomes more important. And um, I know for establishing equity among students, everyone have a lot of districts are looking at, you know, just having that workbook that can go home. And because some students are living in in homes where they might not have a printer and we're going to be entering this world where we're in and out of school. And is that um, in your mind as you're making a decision about what curriculum to go with? Absolutely, um, that's a great question and something, it's right on the rubric as we are looking at each program. There's a whole section on that home school component and what is available and we are um, have spoken to both programs about what is their online component and you know how does that factor and they've actually had to make some some moves their own because obviously um, this was an unknown for everybody this past year and so they've actually you know been responsive in their programming and so the, that is that's a great question and one that's that we will be looking at when we finish up our pilot. Other questions? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Other questions? Okay. Well, super. Well, thank you, uh, Principal Sullivan. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Scollins. Um, I'm at this point uh, I'm told. Oh, I'm sorry. Were there more questions? No. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. It's, it says Zoom effect. And I can't. <laughs> Um, but I, I uh, obviously uh, I'll let um, Principal Sullivan uh, go at this point. I know that Dr. Scollins has some family matters to attend to, so I told her I'd let her go after this presentation. And then Margaret, thanks for hanging in there. Um, I don't think that uh, they'll they'll have any more questions unless you have any questions for Margaret. I'd like to let her. I just I just I do want to say is this did I hear this is Margaret's last meeting? This will be the last meeting. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to say that, uh, Margaret, it's been an absolute pleasure having you, uh, having you uh, be part of the committee and give your input. 
I found your, I always found your insight to be, uh, to be um, extremely useful and valuable to what we do here. And as you've heard me say before, uh, you know, we're all here because of all of you. And um, I think in my opinion, one of the best things we did this year was to include the students as part of this process. And Dr. Sullivan, Dr. Scollins, I really thank you for making that possible. I know Dr. Sullivan put a, a lot of personal thought into it and, uh, and he made some great picks and you were one of those, Margaret, and uh, you're a very impressive person. And uh, I, I, whatever you plan on doing in the future, whether it's college or some other pursuit, I am sure that you, uh, you will leave your mark on uh, your piece of this world. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck in blazing your, your trail. Off to American, correct? Right, with the American University. Yes. Huh? Thank you very much. Good luck. Can we, do, can we do a Zoom clap? I don't know. Does that work? I don't know. Sure. Clap. You, you can also remember. Can, we, the, can um, we make it happen? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway. So. Well, anyway, yeah. I can't do it in real life, too. Congrats, Margaret. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night, Alice. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. 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 I believe next up is the. What is next up here? Hold on. Um, it's enrollment. Enrollment. Okay. Get the hiring. Here we go. All right. So our enroll. Oh, now I'm going to test my uh, my ever failing eyes here. I guess I can make this bigger. Hold on. There we go. That's much better. I can see that. Um, so just the enrollment trends. You know, you can see um, are kind of staying fairly consistent. I know you had a chance to look at this before. Oh, there's anything that you want to um, talk about uh, on this doc that would be helpful to you. Give you a chance to kind of look at it. Yeah. No, there's, there's no significant change. I, I didn't look no. at last year's to see, you know, uh, what we have last year is the change from April to May. There's, there's no big change no. at this point. Fairly consistent. So any questions about the enrollment or thoughts? Yeah, um, I have a thought. Um, I'm just, you know, we're all reading about um, a lot of these Catholic schools recently have been closing. Um, there's one in Weymouth that's been closing and I know we have one here in St. Paul in Hingham. I just, I'm just curious that uh, we considering a, a higher enrollment, do we think that um, the question would be is do we see more kids maybe not opt into private school because of, you know, economic or, I mean, there, there is a lot of consideration in looking at that enrollment this year. Just a thought. It's a really good one. The, the thoughts on enrollment are very perplexing right now for me personally, as I'm thinking about, you know, will, um, will we have more homeschooling situations happening? And I hope, I hope obviously we don't because I feel we could put out a, a great product for folks. Um, but I do, I do wonder about that. And uh, yeah, I, I also had thought of the, the potential closing of some of the smaller private schools, if that would boost our enrollment. Not sure how much that would boost it. Those schools are so small, but you know, the, the, um, the, the effect, the total effect might actually do that. I don't know, Michael, did you, well, you looked at these trends as well. Do you have any thoughts on that question? Yeah. I mean, I think like you say, it, it it, the the numbers aren't. I don't think they'll be big enough to make to really skew any one particular part of this the district. So, if we get some at various different grades or schools, I think we have the capacity to absorb them. But like you say, we just need to keep an eye on it and make sure there's there's no bubbles anywhere where we have higher numbers and elsewhere. Right. Yeah. The the problem is we won't really know until it kind of happens. That's going to be the, you know that's going to be the kicker you know if we start to see more folks enrolling and these enroll we'll have to keep an eye on these enrollment trends that could have a have an impact but um i don't know paul i have to see i i, I agree with michael i think that the uh, overall effect would be just just smaller than um i think you might be thinking but i could be wrong okay all right so no further thoughts on that it is fairly stable that's why i really don't have anything to yeah say about it. Um, next is our hiring update and we do have some new hires here that I want to cue you in on. Um, 
we're in a good spot. Uh, we do we did have a recent uh, retirement announcement that we'll be posting uh, at the elementary school. I don't know that I can talk about that yet, but uh, these are the these are the hires that we have um, and their start dates. And I think from our last meeting, we were able to uh, obviously we hired I, we hired Barbara Sirwanka, who will begin on July first. Um, we did hire a uh, um, a new high school Spanish French teacher named Lauren Svensson. She's wonderful. I met with her. She'll be starting as all new teachers do on the 27th of August. We hired uh, Allie Pierce, a middle school counselor. Very impressive. All of the new hires I've met with virtually, obviously, but um, been so impressed with them. The hiring teams did an amazing job, really an amazing job with these folks. Uh, another Allie, uh, Allison Thornton, we've hired for a high school science teacher, obviously um, for uh, Patty Thompson's retirement. You can see the who they're replacing there on the right. And then um, we did hire Stephanie Kennedy in our open kindergarten position. Stephanie had been um, working in uh, the first grade classroom for, for some time, you can see up above. And she was in our district before um, as an ESP. And she's fabulous, certified teacher. And it's nice to see the teacher we had in there uh, replacing the teacher that um, was um, not, you know, in a in a replacement situation is the person who we uh, hired for the kindergarten position because she beat out all the other people. So she was wonderfully qualified, um, and we're very happy to have Stephanie with us in another role. And then uh, Lee Harms will be the grade one teacher. Uh, Lee, uh, unfortunately, was bumped uh, out when we had to cut some positions. She because just because of experience uh, in the district, uh, we were very. It was, it was a very unfortunate thing, and we're very fortunate to have her back. So that's a that's a nice situation, and uh, we do have an opening for the high school secretary, which uh, we will um, should be closing fairly soon. And uh, that's it right now. So we're in a good solid position. Like I said, we'll, it looks like we're gonna have some movement uh, from a very recent retirement. We may have some, which I'm not at liberty to announce right now, but I, and I do believe we will have a little more movement, but I, I feel good about uh, where we are in terms of hiring at this stage. And that makes me very much smile <laughs> because we weren't there a few, uh, few weeks ago. So that's wonderful. Any questions on any of these hires or anything? I'm very proud of the work that the teams have done. Okay, so next, I'm gonna get my agenda up here. We have, uh, oh, I'm turning it over to Michael. Yeah. All right, Michael. I, I'm sorry, Patrick, I, I, I couldn't get my mute. <laughs> oh, no, no worries, Paul, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I just had one other question. Um, what about we was we were also looking at hiring a part time custodian? Uh, is that is that also out there? And what are what are some of the other positions that yeah. we're currently looking at? Well, so remember now we we have our tier one asks that are, are going to be voted on by at town meeting. Okay. Once they're uh, and I'm saying this very hopefully once it's approved we will then immediately post um, for those positions. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, um, so that's where we are. Is that correct, Michael, in terms of? Yeah, yeah. that's right. So we tend to, we always wait for town meeting just to be on the safe side in case anything goes awry there. Normally, of course, town meeting happens in April or, or May at the latest, just we're in this pickle now because it's happening so much later. We just can't post for those positions until that happens. And the only good news with that is uh, the competitive, the towns around us who would be competing for these folks are in the same pickle. There's no, no difference. And they're not going to post either because their budgets are so tenuous. Uh, yeah. So we will, um, we will post those. And, you know, I know you're aware of those positions, Paul, the, the mentioned, but we'll post those when we can. And we're, we're, ha we're we'll be very happy if we can. Okay. Um, without further ado, then I will turn it over to Michael. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. Can you, do you have, are you host too? Do I have to make your yes, host? Yes, I have the power, let's see. Take it away. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna just do the finance update for me. So 
a this time around and I think hopefully going forward and I've spoken to Susan about this so just doing a short cover note to go along with the finance reports just to give you an idea of kind of the key points from those reports and then also just updating some other major projects because I know they are of interest to everybody and just to give us an opportunity to talk about them but first I'll just talk about the the overall budget summary report so we are at a 80.35 percent of expenditure completed which is a, a little better than all this same time last year but as I mentioned in my report you go back a couple of years before this we actually were would normally have expended even less than this in the last few years so in this 70s so I think it's right about where we'd want it to be we do have again you know really utilities has helped keep that uh, so here the utilities has helped keep our budget our expenditure down as you can see we're still under budget there or we're low and uh, and also just other which is kind of various say, subscriptions and so on which we're not been doing because schools been closed as well as uh, supplies are low again and again I think that's driven by the fact schools not being open for the last third of the year and that's helped to keep those costs down another one area I wanted to highlight was just contracted services which is right now showing over above budget that's due to a couple of things a uh, the main one is well legal services at the moment is showing but we've encumbered some of those costs and I think we might not end up spending all that we encumbered which is why I have not requested a transfer or anything that yet so I think we might stay below 100% on this budget a uh, legal services and there was one other area a medical therapeutic services I think we're just right around on budget for the a uh, let me just double check uh, yeah there's really those are the big major ones uh, medical therapeutic services where again we've got some additional funds encumbered and I'm not sure we're going to spend them all so we'll just see how the next couple of weeks we finish out and how June finishes but yeah so with all that in mind I think we're going to come in a little bit as discussed before we'll have a little a, come in a little under budget at the end of the year and we'll be able to use those funds for couple of key a projects we need to complete as well as special ed pre-purchasing and hopefully leave some for special ed stabilization fund so that will be a sort of this is a preview of me coming back at the next school committee meeting to get your final approval on some transfers and how we spend the last of the money any questions on that report before I move on so the other a report I wanted to highlight is the revolving and grant summary report hey uh, this all looks good this looks exactly where we'd hoped it be right now the only so the only issue here is still this safer schools grant which are still showing a deficit so the town has now received those funds so hopefully they will get that will get posted there soon and then we'll get that a uh, that'll be all spent out so that'll have zero that but that will be zeroed out that project's all finished those cameras are all in now so that'll be good and then everything else uh, is right where we'd want it to be we've got good balances a uh, school lunch is lower than it's we're still got it's showing a healthy balance here despite the you know the fact we've not been bringing in money for the last third of the year at the same time as paying is paying salaries so I'm pleased about that any questions about that report um Michael yes you, um, you know maybe a, a project for Susan once you know she gets up and running is some of these revolving funds haven't changed the balance in over a year if we just look at the yeah. first one the alumni field fund has has been there um, and I don't I honestly don't know what that fund is for um, or why we have it and if it's yeah. for alumni it, field, then then maybe it ought to be utilized to, you know, for maintenance or um, upkeep of the field. But again, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure why we have that. Yeah, there's a couple like that, like the Athletic Hall of Fame as well. Yeah, well, the Hall of Fame rotates every two years, and I'm surprised we haven't heard. This is 
this would be a year that they would have an induction ceremony in November. Right. Um, and so they do a fundraiser. So, so that goes, but like the um, insurance recovery ha has been at $6,000 for three years since the, the great flood of, you know, yeah. 2017 or whatever year that was, yeah. 2016. Um, and that was for floors, wasn't it? So I just don't know if some of the small yeah. dollars, I mean, they're small dollars, but they're sitting there year over year, not, yeah. do, you know, not doing anything. So maybe we can figure out what's going on with them. Yeah, I think it's a great project for Susan. Yeah, and also too, is if we can look at some of the capital budget stuff that we can maybe look into um, that we need. And maybe we can take, take into consideration those. Uh, could yeah. you put that back up what it was? I'm sorry, could you, could you put that screen back up? Which screen? The one we just had about uh, with the budget. This one? About the revolving funds? Yeah, I, I can't see yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I, uh, um, I don't think you can repurpose revolving there. funds to something that they weren't intended for. I think we just need to find out what these were intended for. Yeah, that's a good question. If we yeah. can, if we can do that, because if there's one to fix the fields, why would we use that to fix the fields? You know, if, yeah. there's, if there's another one to um, supplies, I don't know. They they have to be for. I, I get that part of it. I just I'm glad that we're bringing this to the forefront because it's important. I, I think every dime we can find to, for the schools is 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 so needed, especially with the facilities and. No, so I was happy to say that in the in the last finance committee that we were able to find some money for some two more water fountains, and uh, you know I was happy to see that uh, some water hydration stations. So I think that's great that we can like try to dive in and see what we can find for the for the best for the school. And then, all right, any other questions on this? report and then the last uh, report really is the, the, the vehicle maintenance log we actually uh, no expenditure in May on this I mean that's not to say that, that a transportation team missing Chris went working on the vehicles they were doing some repairs and so on we just didn't spend any money on them they did pass a school bus inspections in, during May though so they're ready to go when we need them okay. And then the last thing was, which I had included in the report, was just a kind of summary of where we are in a number of key projects we've got going on. Um, we're expecting to be delivered soon, hopefully mid-June. The work has started in the middle school entrance upgrades. The alarm system upgrades has been completed, and uh, that the, system, the alarm systems have been upgraded and activated. Uh, PA systems are underway, that's in progress. Security cameras are completed. The water fountains installation, we have appointed a vendor, and we were just waiting for it to schedule that work. Osgood playgrounds obviously underway. The auditorium projector, we're just sort of saw, we've got three quotes. There was a bit of a hold up for that. We've got three quotes, and hopefully we'll get that vendor selected soon. And also some sidewalk repairs going to be scheduled to the town engineer, just depending on the vendors. Schedule. I've recently awarded the old contract for a trash collection and disposal to a new vendor who will start on July 1st, which I will deliver good savings. We are looking to schedule painting of the high school cafeteria and also some lighting upgrades. We're just awaiting the state because that's technically over because it's over $5,000. The state has to approve it, so we're just awaiting for that approval. And then the last are not so much capital projects, but just other projects we're involved with. One is the FY21 bus fees and the routes, because now we have seven routes instead of six. So there's work ongoing to, de to de design those new bus routes. And a Donna in the office with Geraldine is a, a, and Teresa, they're all working on the fee reimbursement to get checks back to families for kindergarten and athletics and preschool and transportation. And a, I should say Lisa Tokars in the high school office as well is working on that. Michael, I have a, I have a question. And yeah. I should have the answer to this. I know we're going to have seven routes for 
Osgood and Deer Hill, are we going to have seven routes at the middle high school as well? Yeah, that's the plan. Okay. Partly just so we can get it. Yeah, just so yes, we are. Um, I have a question while we're on that topic. I, I'm really, I'm really thinking about the changes that are going to happen and, and can we start anticipating some of these changes and is there any discussion about the buses? Well, no. that's probably why we've held off on issuing the B bus fee registration forms because we wanted to wait and see what came out of the state. Yeah, I mean, the CDC guidelines for buses are, are I believe, almost un untenable um, for schools. You know, like even the CDC is what I, I'm told adjusting their their thoughts around it. The initial guidance was like 12 on a school bus. It's just not happening in, in, in even a small district. So, um, and the commissioner had referenced that in the call. So I, I do believe there'll be a more limited amount of students on buses, for instance, but we don't know. So, so does really that mean more, does that mean more, like more routes or? No, it won't mean more routes. It'll just mean it'll mean less kids on the buses, um, which wouldn't be uh, a necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, I just don't because I don't have the steady guidance. I'm not we're not sure how that'll play out. It's very frustrating, Jen. Um, I wish I had that information, but it's really hard to plan for something like that when you don't don't even have a thought on it. I mean, it, it, it's that we know there are going to be less kids on the buses, but we don't know how many less are going to be on the buses. So if there, there are less kids on, I mean, so everything is sort of interrelated and, and I mean, how does that work? If, if there are going to be less kids on the bus, is the idea that, you know, kids will go to school every other day or uh, so it could be, if we don't know, it could be every other, it could be every other week. It could be, you know, you have a group going one week and the group is back doing remote learning and then we flip flop. So, you know, isn't it a little premature to be talking about this stuff? Because, you know, I mean, they're not even going to come out until like mid June with the recommendations, right? Dr. Sullivan. And then, yeah. and then, you know, if you look at it, you know, we got what two months before the, you know, two full months. Well, well more than that, we got three full months before the school year starts. So it's like two months ago, we were at like the beginning of this whole thing. So I, I, let's just wait and see if that's even, I, mean, I don't know, I, I think well, things. Yes, Greg, you're right. And, and also back to my statement, Jennifer, that it's gonna be 85 to 90% prescriptive. It literally is gonna prescribe exactly what we need to do. So we're gonna be in, in, in a lot of ways reacting to the information and creating it. But until we know what that prescription is, I go back to the commissioner's statements, which is don't jump the gun. You know, uh, it just, it's, we're planning in hypotheticals and I don't even know what those hypotheticals would be right now. Right. It's really so, hard. So I, can I just, I think you've said this three times. I just want to make sure I understand it. When you say that they are going to be 95% prescriptive, so, that means- Oh, I said 85 to 90 Okay, right. Sorry. Um, that means we are expected to do what they say. We yes, it, these are the he, the commissioner is making the point that this is time for the Department of Education to grab the reins and to give school communities a consistent and steady prescription for what we need to do, and that is exactly what we're going to do. And his messages have been in this particular regard, you know, I haven't seen the document, but it's to stick with the group. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to do. Uh, unless there's something that really ap applies to Cohasset that we can make a case for in being different. And then we'd have the ability to do that. But it, uh, we're going to get the information and we're going to look at it in, and we're going to do exactly what is said and try to work our community around that. That's it. That's where we are. That's where we are right now. Right. Um, Michael, can you just make a note? Could you send me the um, the detailed month end report, please? Yeah. Thank yes. You. Okay. 
that's me unless there's any more questions uh no no okay no. so um it's on to uh our section we need to uh everyone should have received in their email or um have the calendar the 20 2021 calendar we just need to pencil in our meeting dates um for next year the next school year you know beginning um in july and we typically meet on the first and the third wednesday of every month uh skipping vacation weeks and holidays so does anyone know of um specific dates that so the calendar that that um jennifer sent out has the first and the third Wednesdays bolded and underlined? I have it up here, Ellen. Okay, thank you. As tentative meeting dates, um, and we can go with those unless um, anyone has some specific concerns. And if not, all, then all we need to do is pick July and August um, dates. The um, Let's see, our next, our next meeting will be the 17th. That'll be the final meeting of this committee as constituted um, until FY21 starts in July. I personally would not have an object objection to skipping Wednesday, July 1st and having our first meeting be on the 8th of July so that it doesn't run into the holiday weekend. So moved. Um, and then, have the second meeting of July on the 22nd. That'd be great. Okay. Um, and then August would be the 5th and the 19th. So we, it keeps us at, at two week intervals. Um, if that's okay. In, in the past, committees have opted, prior to me being on, on, on the committee, to have one meeting in July and one meeting in August. But I, I think that things are, particularly this year, I think we need to at least have two meetings each month scheduled um, because of the, the needs of the district and decisions that will need to be made once guidance comes out and once, you know, with Patrick's um, uh, back to school, um, subcommittee plan, steering team plan. I think it's important that we at least block off dates to meet so that we can attend to, to business. Um, we can opt as we did last year to take one of those meetings like the 20, meeting of the 22nd as a workshop for the committee, but we can make that decision later. That doesn't have to be decided now. Well, in my timeline, the 22nd might be a little, I was thinking of around the 29th having those public forums um, available, but I might be, we might, if we do keep a 22nd, I might be able to use that as, as uh, potentially as some, um, unless we think we should do it separately. Um, I think I'll have the roadmap. My goal is to have the roadmap late July, early August. So, so if you have it late July, then if we meet on August the 5th, then that would work. That yeah, would be great. Um, and, and the other thing, you know, we need to consider um, too is how much longer do we meet virtually and and I haven't heard any guidance from the town yet of when in person meetings are going to resume. I, I think everyone is is doing virtual meetings for the foreseeable future. Um, but I think it would be nice to get back to seeing each other in person with with a mask six feet apart. But we can address that later. So are we all in agreement with the, the dates of July 8th and the 22nd, August 5th and the 19th, and then the other dates as outlined? I can do any dates if we're meeting virtually. I may have a conflict with August 5th if we're meeting in person. Okay. Fine, as long as we have a quorum though, right? Right, right. You can always call in. Okay. You, yeah. can always, you, can always, you can always call if, if I honestly I don't think by August 5th we'll be meeting in person right. um, but in the event that we are you can always call in on, on the phone okay uh, that's perfectly acceptable that's fine okay um, 
All right, great. Thank you. Um, are there any comments um, from subcommittees? Um, just one thing that there is a interfaith peace vigil being planned for the common on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. So the Cohasset clergy have all come together to plan a vigil and they want it to be a time when people feel comfortable bringing family, their whole family to be, you know, distant with masks and everything. Um, for, let me see, let me read it. A prayers for our nation in the time of conflict, prayers for an end to racism and violence, prayers of grief, compassion, listening, and hope. So that's being planned on Saturday morning, FYI. I think that is in the middle of the diploma handout. Is that correct, Patrick? Yeah, it is. Um, it is, but you know, I don't know. The, the other thing is, I don't know what the weather's got set for us on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a rain date of Sunday for the diploma. And um, I know there was some, yeah. some talk about that. I would obviously have to make that decision quickly, but just so you know, I think, I think it's, it's supposed to be a little shaky on Saturday. A little shaky, yeah. It looks a little shaky. Okay. New England, though, Pat, it doesn't mean anything uh, ahead of 24 hours, so. Yeah. You got that right. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else, uh, Ashley? I think you know. Okay. No. Paul? Yes. I think we, uh, Craig and I need to finish up with the uh, superintendent evaluation. Is that correct? By June 17th? Um, we'll finish. No. Oh, you finished that. That's right. That's right. Where we all have to do our, Paul, so on your email, you probably got a uh, evaluation. We all have to do our evaluate, our final evaluation. So we got to just get that to Ellen. Okay. So I'll, I'll finish mine, I guess, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. I just wanted to clarify that. Lots, lots of bread. Egg. Great. Great. Looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Did you have something? I had, um, I had a couple of, um, one is just a minor thing and it was, it's getting back to the calendar. Yeah. Is there any way we could, just for visual purposes, can we just put an insert for the, the kindergarten things? It just, it kind of looks funny to have that long list there. Yeah. I, I, I we didn't know how to do it. You know, we just, we, so, it's so if we put like a box, in the bottom sort of a lot sort of in the same place as the one that explains everything and just have kindergartners kind you know families of kindergarten students look in the box for our special kindergarten ske schedule um, i think that might be confusing but i like the box idea patrick what if you just boxed that kindergarten from the see where it has the ninth because it's all yeah. pertinent to this month yeah, I, I I totally agree with you. It does look odd. Um, we went back and forth. I mean, we were we were struggling with it even in the meeting, and then when we started trying right. to figure it out, right. I just I, I basically made the executive decision and told Jennifer to put it all on there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I can see the way it looks. Looking at it now, it does look kind of funky. Um, but maybe you could box it up or something, and so it it stands out. Yeah, I think we can do that. We'll work on that um, for sure. I yeah, like you could just, here. it's really just the kindergarten stuff that throws everything off. If you could just title it the kindergarten schedule or something. We will, we'll, we'll figure something out. I agree. Visually, it doesn't look right. And then um, as long as we were mentioning the superintendent evaluation, um, Patrick, I know you had um, your binders. I do. Is is any of that um, available in sort of electronic form or should we come in and look at the binders? So I do, I did have that, I do have a summary of some of the things that are in the binders that I actually, it was part of my review in the mid, the midterm. Yeah, there was the January 22nd. Was, yeah, all that was really technically supposed to be reviewed there were goals but I also put in information about standards in just summative, a summary form. And then I instructed if anybody wants to look at the, my work on the standards to come in and look at the, um, at the binders. I don't have all of it electronically. 
Um, hmm. I mean, if, if it's helpful, I could probably have Jennifer try to scan some of them. They're fairly no, large. No, no, that's too much work. Um, I, that's you fine. Can have a look. You know, our, our office is open now, nine to nine okay. to three. Um, not to make you come in. And, and it, look, anyway, anything I can do to give you the information, please, I, I'll do that. So whatever I can do to furnish some of that. I think it might be a good idea maybe to send out at least the what you did on uh, January 20. Yeah, I had sent that to Ellen and thinking that maybe she would share that with you. Do you I, want me I to did. resend that? No, yeah. I mean, oh, I did send it to everybody. Okay. With the, evalu with the evaluate. It was the second email after I sent out the evaluation form. Yeah, it has it has the goals, my summary of where I wrote the goals, and then it has every single standard and some of the things I've done for every standard. Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw I just saw the form. I'll look more closely. <laughs> That's you, fine. And that, you know, I, let, let me know, Jen, and I'll resend it. Okay. Oh, okay. If I can't find it, I'll let you know. Yeah, and you know, another another really good place to look as your is the website. I've kept the superintendent page pretty up to date. All my newsletters are on there and everything that's happened since March, which wasn't too far away from when we did our review is on there. All of my updates, like literally everything we've done that is I've sent out for uh, COVID-19 and even in the case of the, the George Floyd tragedy and um, it's all on there. It's um, okay. So you can so, get um, a lot of evidence. I guess my question is then is, but there's pertinent stuff in these binders that we should look at. There is, but remember the binders were pretty much assembled based on the um, information that I had summarized for you in January. Okay. But so what you'd find in the binders are, is a more thorough, like uh, it, it's really the exemplars of what I put in that summary. So you okay. can look at it, look at what I wrote and then find it in the binder. So Jen, every, Jen everything you pretty much need, Ellen emailed to us to, to be okay. able to pull it out. Okay. So, um, and we can just go ahead and schedule time to look at the binders. Oh yeah, you can yeah. just come in. You can just go, go in ahead. and look at the binders. They're, they're, they'll be right there on the, actually I'm looking at them right now. So they're not there, they're right over here. I okay. would just ask a couple things, but I'll, I'll make sure I have them in there tomorrow. I'm going in tomorrow early uh, for a bit. So just, I'll have them in there. Um, I'll keep them right. So as you walk in, you'll see them on the side table uh, where we file things. Um, yeah. Right on top of it. And there are four um, rather hefty binders for each of the standards and the goals. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, anyone else on subcommittees or reports? No. Okay. So I just have a couple of things. Um, I sent out late this afternoon a recap of the town leadership meeting on this past Monday. We'll be meeting again this coming Monday. Next Tuesday night, um, I have requested, and I went back out again today. Um, well, we requested of Kevin McCarthy and Chris Senior to be on the Board of Selectmen agenda for the 9th of June for the uh, School Facility Committee reconstitution. I sent them a follow-up note, and then I sent them materials on that today. Um, I have asked that all of us get invited to that <clears throat> Zoom meeting. I'm not going to post it as a school committee meeting because we won't be deliberating amongst ourselves. We'll just be presenting. And I think what they'll do, as Diane Kennedy had mentioned, is there's a list of uh, town boards and committees that are appointed positions and they'll add this, this one to the list. So that will be Tuesday night, June 9th. Um, Thanks for staying on that, Ellen. Sure. I wanted to give you a heads up about our last meeting of the year on June 17th. We just discussed we'll be conducting superintendent Dr. Sullivan's evaluation, year-end evaluation. We'll also be recapping uh, our performance against our goals in the year-end and uh, some of the other things that were accomplished this year. Uh, Michael mentioned earlier we're going to do a uh, look at the end of FY20, the financial picture, uh, budget surplus, and any transfers that will require our authorization um, to make. Uh, anything that moves from one cost center to the, to the other requires our authorization. And um, we will have executive session for approval of minutes. I'm just trying to wrap up the last set of minutes for all of our e-sessions. So, um, and then I haven't actually talked with Dr. Sullivan about any additional items to be included um, 
on that agenda. So with all that being said, if the committee is willing and Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Scollins and Michael are available, I wouldn't mind starting at six. Um, if that works out, I know that can be, you know, the dinner hour, but if we start at six um, instead of seven on Wednesday the 17th, I think it will give us time and energy to, to get through a very important meeting. And I wasn't thinking of having a student update at that meeting, if that's okay with this group, uh, because of everything that's on there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine with me. I can do it. It's okay. also Michael McMillan's final meeting with us here. At, right. Uh, and, and Jen's final meeting with us as well. I know. Very so, sad. Oh, yeah. Both cases. So we'll plan on six o'clock if you want to just take, if you need a day to look at your calendars and get back to me. Um, if it, if it doesn't work, just let, let me know. Um, and what else did I have? So I told you about the joint meeting next week. I'm not gonna, okay. So I think that's it from- Wait, Could I have just one comment? Um, I'm yeah. not getting the um, agendas, nor am I getting the login in uh, the Zoom information prior to the meetings. Um, and also- I noticed that it's actually on the agenda now. It's on the agenda. So oh, I clicked on it. So oh, I didn't, different. I didn't, we used to get like a separate invitation, but now it's, Paul, it's just on, on the agenda. Well, yeah, well, you, should, you should also get a personalized invitation. So yeah, that's the uh, one. I'm, Cause I did. Yeah. Get but if you don't get it. Say. Yeah. So if, so if you click on the, so if you get the personalized email, which I sent out on, Monday, I think that brings you in as a panelist, and you you're on this this group. If you use the one that's on the uh, agenda, I believe that brings you in as an attendee and a participant, and then you get promoted to be in to be a panelist. So awesome. I mean, yeah. Both roads lead to the same place. That's great. I need to be promoted. Um, I don't the, know why you're not getting the agendas or the, oh, the ones that Jennifer that, sent out. You don't yeah, get those. Must have yeah, gotten, I'm not get, I'm not getting it. Um, You're not getting the agendas and the school no, packets from Jennifer I, on Friday? I haven't, I haven't been getting them. I'll uh, check with that, Paul. I'll, I'll look okay, no worries. No worries. The other thing I was going to say is that um, two things in that are different than the normal meetings. One is the we're not doing the Pledge of Allegiance, which I'd like to see if we could do. And also, too, is public comment. Are we just kind of Facebook or is, are we going to set an agenda? to put it on the agenda that we're actually like bring it up or are we doing it now pretty much you can just email in a question or facebook um the pledge of allegiance we would need a flag i i personally don't have one in my office my home office um to do um i don't know if anyone here has one um yeah i, I could bring one or we could put one up i know? can share one on the screen yeah it would be nice, you know. I can I mean, share an image of a flag. I just say, just say. Yeah, it's part of the process. I don't want to leave, you know, this great country out. Yeah. Um, and and regards to pu public comment, um, that that's a good question. I hadn't I hadn't thought of it. I think I think the Q and A um, function that we have here. Uh, and actually, no no one is. Maybe people are watching, and I was incorrect. We are live on Facebook. Um, let me find out how other committees are are handling it. Um, I'm just trying to think. Of, Michael, how would public comment work? Would someone come in and you would invite them for public comment? Yeah, you could just say, you could just say, does anybody? Well, I'm just trying to think. So would they be in the waiting room? And then you would they be in the waiting room and then you would invite them in? Yeah, I think you can. You could let them speak, I think, but you wouldn't be able to. So I'm just going to have a quick look. We don't have anybody that's in there at the moment. Yeah, I believe you can allow them to speak. So you could ask them to raise their I think they can raise their hand. You could ask them to raise their hand, and then you could give them the opportunity to speak. OK. All right, so yeah. So let, let me look into that and see, see how we could handle that. Um, OK. So. If there's nothing else under school committee comments and communications, let's move on. We have four sets of minutes to go through and approve. Um, 
And we'll start with the first set from Wednesday, April 15th. Hopefully everyone had a chance to review them. I sent these, maybe Paul, maybe why you didn't see the agenda packet was because I responded all with the minutes for approval. So you have to dive down into the email. It's part of what I hate about this outlook is you have to dive down into the email to find, find the packet. Did you get the minutes, Paul? You're muted. Yeah, I, I, I did get the minutes. Okay, so so the packet email was embedded in, in that because I just replied all on that one. Okay. All right, so, um, so minutes of Wednesday, April 15th. Any comments or corrections? None? Okay, can I have a motion to approve those school committee minutes of April 15th? So moved. I have a second. Second. Um, all in favor, roll call. I, Jen Madden. I, Paul Kearney. I, Ashley Cleary. I, Ellen Marr. I, Craig McClellan. Thank you. Okay, uh, minutes of Wednesday, May 6th. Any comments or corrections? None, okay. All right, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 6th? So moved. Uh, second? Second. Second. All in favor, roll call, please. I, Paul Kearney. I, Ashley Cleary. I, I, Jen, Mark. I Jen Madden. I, Craig McClellan. Thank you. Okay, minutes of Tuesday, May 12th, the joint meeting with uh, Board of Selectmen. I have a motion to approve? So moved. moved. Jen moved it. Second? Second, Craig McClellan. Roll call, please. I, Jen Madden. I, Paul Kearney. I, Ashley Cleary. I, Ellen Marr. I, Craig McClellan. And finally, in the minutes of May 13th, any comments or corrections? I can't believe there's not a single typo in any set of these. Um, any comments or corrections? None, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor, roll call please. I, Paul Kearney. I, Ashley Cleary. I, Ellen Marr. I, Jen Madden. I, Craig McClellan. Okay, thank you. I'll get these posted. Okay. Um, no follow-up and updates, no topics. Unless, Ashley, did you want to talk about the, the uh, legal counsel search or no? Can I, I can send an email if everyone just replies to me and, and I can compile the document, correct? Yes. Yep, that's what I'll do. Thank okay. you. All right, so any further business, Dr. Sullivan? Uh, none, unless, none? Michael, okay. do you have any, Michael? Nothing for me. Okay. Nope. Nope. From us. All this right. Let's, let's not find stuff just because we're finishing before <laughs> nine o'clock at night. Well, I do have War and Peace I could read. I have it right here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can I have a motion to adjourn at 8.56 p.m.? So moved. Second. Second. Craig McClellan. Roll call, please. Hi, Jim Madden. Hi, Paul Kearney. Hi, Ashley Caleri. Hi, Ellen Marr. Hi, Craig McClellan. Great. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.